What are you trying to tell me? That I can dodge bullets? I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. And let's start with the Law of Nations. And I want to start here because for five years now, Matrix Solutions has been up. I only talked for three. There's been a lot of reasons why that, that occurred that way, uh, among them being that there was nobody rebutting any of the information I was saying. And I had said many times that there was enough information here already that if someone's devoted themselves to it and learned how to conceptualize, there was enough information here to get you home. But Matrix Solutions in and of itself really focused about, let's say, 75, 80 percent of its time on talking about all the rabbit holes in this system. The choice, which I said that there really is no choice. That's what I learned through, through my experience and going through the federal courts, going through the Supreme Court, and all the agents that ended up showing up around and watching other acquaintances, people that would call, they would find out about me and find out about our work, and you know, it was always too late uh, most of the time that they had gone down the wrong path. Uh, they had done something incorrect. They didn't understand the choice. They didn't understand jurisdiction. They thought they did. We really need to look at our maxims to analyze and make sure that they're right. One of those maxims being knowledge is power. Well, that's inaccurate. Knowledge is not power. The wrong knowledge doesn't create any power. And the right knowledge with the wrong actions create no power, which is what we saw a lot of. And it's only the right knowledge combined with the right action that creates power. And I consider that to be a better maxim than just flippantly saying that knowledge is power, because it's not. Again, back to the choice. This is the law of nations, or as he says here, the principles of law of nature apply to the conduct and affairs of sovereigns and of nations, or nations of sovereigns. This is by Vital, which has turned out to be the most popular version of the law of nations over time, uh, especially in more recent history. In book number one in the Law of Nations is of nations considered in themselves. And in going forward here, keep this question in mind. Where's your contract or your global agreement that stipulates that you have any rights? So what is this choice? Well, one of the things that I wanted to cover first off is this last vestige of what I see with the Patriot gurus and all the teachers out there talking about the birth certificate and talking about the UCC and the bonding and all that kind of stuff. And it's all done from this perspective that for some reason until they did bonding in UCCs, I suppose there was never any slaves that existed on this planet. There were never any citizens, and there were never any, any, anyone that got themselves into bondage because obviously you couldn't have bondage if you didn't have a birth certificate and a, a bond contract that was done through the UCC through the Department of Human Resources. I have no clue where that thinking came from. I heard it right off the bat in the year 2000, 2001. I'm like, this is retarded. People have been born slaves throughout time. And they told their children, hey, we're slaves. We're here in Egypt. And by the time you get to my age, you're going to be making mud and bricks. This is just axiomatic. Now, the question is, how did all this occur? Uh, what, what does this law of nations have to do in talking about our standing and how these things happen? So when we start with this, we start in actually section 212, which goes down way down in book one. It starts talking about citizens and natives and what this means to be a citizen and how you get to that. Citizens are members of civil society, bound to the society by certain duties and subject to its authority. So there you go. Citizens are subjects. They're subject to the authority. And they equally participate in its advantages. Now, I want to stop here just for a second. There are, obviously, from one state to another state, advantages and disadvantages. And that's been that way throughout time. And there has been times where beneficial kings and beneficial people in government rose up. And people that were citizens agreed with that. And if they didn't agree, but obviously there was a solution, there was a remedy. We'll get to that right off the bat because this page actually covers the choice. The natives or natural-born citizens are those of the country, the parents of who are citizens. As a society cannot exist and perpetuate itself otherwise than by the children of those citizens, those children naturally follow the conditions of their fathers and succeed to all their rights. The society is supposed to desire this. Well, here again, we're talking about natural law. Obviously, this is natural that this would occur. So if the society desires this, it's in consequence of what it owes to its own preservation. And it is presumed as a matter of course that each citizen on entering into the society reserves to his children the right of becoming members of it. The country of the fathers is therefore that of the children. And these become true citizens merely by their tacit consent. Here again, acquiescence is 
it's the rule of the day when it comes to especially international law and treaties and it's accepted protocol as I have shown on the website even if you want to do a session documents to accede to a treaty that existed before you created the state or created a new state or became affiliated with a different state anyway we shall soon see though whether on their coming to their years of discretion they may renounce their right and what they owe to the society in which they were born now it's very interesting this term years of discretion because we assume that that's 18 I assumed that my years of discretion actually was around the age 39 to 40 when I finally woke up and then I was able to have some discretion okay section 220 whether a person may quit his country many distinctions will be necessary in order to give a complete solution to this celebrated question whether a man may quit his country or the society in which he is a member the children are bound by natural ties to the society in which they were born and are under obligation to show themselves grateful for the protection that has afforded their fathers and they are in great measure indebted to it for their birth and education now a lot of people disagree with it and I probably would have a long time ago except I saw through the honor and the grace that we were extended through the courts and through what I see in other countries that I've been in, in living in St. Kitts and lived, being in Mexico and different places, that I was grateful to the U.S. in a large respect because it seemed that things were better here. Now, as I learned more and more about the things that I didn't like and how the society had dissolved itself in accordance with Book 1, Section 33, when a society dissolves itself you have other remedies as well I did have gratitude for it and and I think that's a large part of what separated me from you know as I was asked in the year 2006 you know why did you want to take on this 8,000 pound gorilla and even going back to the year 2000 and this is what the agents and that's what they knew about me I said well I didn't want to take on 8,000 pound gorilla I'm just looking for the door out anyway they ought, therefore, to love it, and as we've already shown, to express a just gratitude to it and requite its services as far as possible by serving it in turn. We have observed above that they have the right to enter society which their fathers were members, but every man is born free. That's, that's a difference of opinion I have, but we'll let it go for now since Vitale speaking here in the Law of Nations. Every man is born free and the son of a citizen. When they come to the years of discretion, may examine whether it's convenient for him to to join the society for which he was destined by birth. If he does not find it advantageous to remain in it, he is at liberty to quit it. This is a universal principle right here. Let's go up to book three. We're still in book one here, but this has been covered on the website in some detail. Uh, in virtue of these same principles, it's certain that when a nation is uneasy under its constitution, it has a right to change it. Now, obviously, 32, uh, 33 is flowing for 32, but there's a reason why I have them out of order here. And the reason why I started out of order by obviously is show the choice going back up to 33 shows this choice again. It's just from a different standpoint when you can't get a redress as the founders said, they couldn't in the United States declaration of independence. They tried to get redress from Britain. They couldn't. So they had to do something different. So it says that you could change this if the whole nation were unanimously inclined to make the change. Well, that wasn't going on in the colonies. About 95% of the people didn't care. Uh, about their little revolutionary war or civil war that they started against their king. And some of them tried to get the bounty on their heads, which is how you can know that they weren't pledged for. Nobody pledged for them at all. And probably the reason why they got crushed after the fact. But it is asked, what to be done if the people are divided? In the ordinary management of the state, the opinion of the majority must pass without dispute for that of the whole nation. Otherwise, it would be impossible for a society to take any resolution. I'll stop here again. There's no such thing as a nation of laws. There's only a nation of the majority because that's what's going to pass. Now, they can also acquiesce. Here again, this tacit consent thing is going to be talked about here. It appears then by parity of reason that the nation may change the Constitution by majority of the votes. That's a typo uh, in on, on the Internet. And whenever there's nothing in that change that can be considered an act, contrary to an act of civil association or to the intention of those united under, the whole are bound to conform to the resolution of the majority. But if the question be to fit a, quit a form of government, which alone appeared the people were willing when they came in and entered the bonds of society, they submitted to it when they entered the bonds of society. If a greater part of a free people, after the example of the Jews, which would be the Hebrews, the whole clan of them, in the time of Samuel, allegedly, but according to the story, if they're weary of liberty and resolve to submit to the authority of a monarch, those that are more jealous of that privilege, so invaluable to those who have tasted it. Now, that privilege is freedom. 
that privileges self-governance and the right of self-determination. And according to their own stories there, there was a tribal split where they said, we're not paying taxes to you guys anymore and we're not coming back down there. So we're exercising the right of self-determination. We're splitting this kingdom in half. Some of that's still going on today. So for those who have tasted it, and though they're obliged to suffer the majority, if they're already in that society, to do whatever they please, they're under no obligation to submit to the new government. Now, I want to make a comment about new governments. If they're passing new legislation and changing the government all the time, technically it's a new government. You can go back in the United States over and over again where they did even a Reformation Act in 1950 to reform the government. And it was a bankruptcy reorganization plan and all that kind of stuff. The solution is this. They may quit a society which seems to have dissolved itself in order to unite again under another form. They have a right to retire elsewhere and to sell their lands and take with them all their effects. In today's world, that's becoming a moot point about taking all of your effects and or selling your lands and doing those kind of things. Because even in that day and time, if we're talking about the founders of the USA, they didn't own any land. Their land grants came from the king. They had naked possession which everybody says is nine-tenths of the law, but I got news for you. The other 10% of the law is the one more important because that's where the jurisdiction comes from. That's who's in control of the contract. That's where your rights originally came from if it was done where it was done under the doctrine of dominion, um, which is uh, the advent of property. Those are all things that are talked about in Vital's Law of Nations, in especially in book two. Okay, moving on here. It may reform the government. If a nation is dissatisfied with the public administration, it may apply the necessary remedies and reform the government. But say, but observe that I say the nation, for I'm very far from meaning to authorize a few malcontents or incendiaries to give disturbance to their governors by murmurs and seditions. So if we look at the United States Code real quick, and this could apply to other codes out there, it may or may not be in there. You don't have to see it in a code. It's just interesting the way it was written in the United States Code, so I'm going to show it. This has to do with loss of nationality. A person who is a national in the United States, whether by birth or naturalization, shall lose his nationalization by voluntarily performing any of the following acts. Number one, obtaining naturalization in a foreign state upon his own application, upon the application filed by a duly authorized agent after the age of 18. Now, I want to mention that real quick. There was a presentation we did uh, that had to do with the extrication series, which is, in my opinion, still by far the best series on the entire DVD set. And that is, is that those minor children, that their agent is the government under the doctrine of parents per tree. You cannot expatriate your children if you are a citizen. Number two, another way out is by taking an oath or making an affirmation or other formal declaration of allegiance to a foreign state, which is exactly what the Declaration of Independence was. See, they leave the clues behind. It didn't tell you that the Declaration of Independence was a de formal declaration of allegiance, which it was to each other to build a, a new society or a new state. And this is backed up in case law in the United States. The only means of divesting oneself of United States citizenship is by voluntarily undergoing a naturalization process. It has to be voluntary. Let's go back to talking about for a minute what I mentioned about birth certificates and being born a citizen and those kind of things. Everybody who's naturalized by natural birth or that comes into the United States later on in life has an oath of allegiance. If you, if you were born into it, you already have it. It's there by default. If you come in later, this is the one you have to take. So therefore this is the same one that everybody else already has. Otherwise you wouldn't be taking it because you couldn't be considered p part of E pluribus unum if you were different than the rest. Now what I said up here at the very top of this, almost all oaths of allegiance are religious in nature. I said almost arbitrarily because I haven't seen one that's not. I declare on oath that I will absolutely entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a citizen or a subject. And I will support and defend the constitutional laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Well, faith and allegiance are religions. So this is statism. This is nationalism. I, you know, it's one of my new maxims that from this perspective, that's, they're not governments. This is a religion. When you're really in your time and need, it's where you go. And that's what most people are doing today. And why I say it's become a religion uh, and why these two terms are misnomers, statism and natu nationalism. This is where people turn to now in their time of need. Uh, anyway, I won't cover any more of the oath. That's, that's axiomatic that everybody who's born in the United States has that oath and they shall bear true faith. And if you're fighting against that and you're murmuring and you have sedition and all that kind of stuff in your heart 
and you're doing it fo- vocally with your mouth, then you're guilty. You violated the law of nations, which is in Article 1, Section 8. Did they have a right to punish that violation of the law of nations? So let's get into making this choice on what it could look like. This was a declaration, and this is page two of the declaration that I did back in 2006. This is when the system was really coming at me pretty hard because we've been pushing hard. We, we watched for six years in their courts, and this is up for six. I, nah, let me take that back. It was about four years, up until December of 2004 when we filed our paperwork in the Supreme Court. Twenty-one of us. We were looking at it as the peaceful settlement to file a tort claim, which is exactly what the Declaration of Independence was, is a tort claim. And then if they couldn't answer the tort, we would use the tort to do something different. Uh, That was not done under the Dominion Melchizedek. It was done under a different name that we had filed, and the courts were actually honoring what we were doing. Um, We'd even filed treaty with the Universal Postal Union. Every time we went to court, we came in as postmasters, and they would call us postmasters. We also came in as judges. In this particular case I'm talking about, we pronounced judgment against the U.S. One of the guys later on, this is part of my story that I haven't told on the website, so I'll get into it just for a second, and you'll know where this little declaration came from. At that time, after I learned that right of self-determination was the peaceful settlement of dispute, when we filed that court case, I wanted to completely go to peace. I said, from now on, nobody will sue any of their attorneys, any of their judges, any of their agents, or anybody. We leave them alone. When you exit out, you don't go back in and talk to them and tell them what to do or go against them because that's interfering with the internal politics of another nation state, which is now an international crime or offense or violation. Well, that occurred. As soon as we did the stuff in the Supreme Court in 2004, we finished it in 2005. And shortly thereafter, one of the crew in his hubris and arrogance decided that somebody in the U.S. made him mad. So he sued one of their agencies again and a judge. And they let him go silent for 18 months. And then they picked him up and then they put him in jail. Between that period of time of 2005 and March 25th of 2006, I had taken the ambassadorial appointment with the Dominion Melchizedek, knowing that I, first of all, needed to break collusion with him. And second of all, I wanted the immunity that came with it. I was beginning to understand more and more of this. So a formal declaration is what we ended up making, a declaration of peace and reconciliation. And to show that it was our intent in seeking the proper standing and station and pursuing the right of self-determination, which is a cause, by the way, as it states in here, for which many, many women and men and nations and states and organizations have sacrificed greatly and at various times given all to ensure that this world, that the peoples of this world, would continue to have that right perpetually. And it was for this cause, being our sacred belief, that this was true, that people have sacrificed greatly for this. And this was our claim of peace. I'll summarize it without reading it. Basically, it was saying that we had intended all along to be at peace. We didn't want to be involved with those other people that were in there trying to sue judges and cause chaos. And part of this was, and I've said it before on the website, part of this was my father and my mother's responsibility to train me properly so that I didn't go in there and cause chaos and disruption in their court systems. I didn't understand the issue of standing. They didn't either. And, of course, they didn't understand anything about law, and it's important, vitally important. It is part of the three keys. You know, one of the maxims that I came out with on the website and came out with actually way before the website ever went up when I first started down this path was that those that don't know are at the mercy of liars. And if you don't think you're not, then wait till you get in those courts. The thing that I have been helping me in my process, I believe, more than anything, was I never had to feel guilt about some of the recommendations and things that I did over all this time because no one that ever listened to my advice has ever gone to prison. And a bunch of those that didn't listen have gone to prison. And obviously I almost ended up there myself. Otherwise I wouldn't have been writing this document, but I had pushed them to the limit at that point. And, and, and there had to be a change. And the real issue was that notice had not been given of what I had already done. And it wasn't my responsibility. Although this document itself came my responsibility and this was where i finally won the honor with the u.s to have them write me back as ambassador the point here being in this claim is that we were trying to seek peace and we were trying to do something different i wanted out of this in 2000 when i moved to st kitts it was the reason i did it 
I just didn't understand back then I was going to have to learn all this other stuff and how to be able to create and write documents such as this. The point here is that this is part of a formal declaration. It's also part of a notice process. But one of the things that happened during this period of time, I'll talk about myself a little bit more, was when I had gone to court to testify against him, uh, what he had done, and this happened on November 3rd of 2006, the declaration occurred about a month later. Uh, not quite a month later. And then I got notice back from them as ambassador. They were acknowledging me about a month after that. But one of the things I told him in the courtroom that day was that I, he asked me to state my name for the record. And I'm going to cover this because I don't know how much I actually ever talked about it on the website that I had changed my name. And literally, I didn't change my name. My name was changed by the universe or whatever happened to me that day because I was there to answer four questions and I got grilled for two hours. But I knew at that time that I was in collusion with him. Collusion is something we'll talk about a little later. Collusion is a hard thing, you know, when you're, especially when you're part of an e pluribus unum state. And we were, we were coming out, 21 of us were coming out. Well, the bottom line is if one offends, then the whole state has offended. And he offended them, and I was in collusion with him, and so I was guilty. So I knew that it was their way of getting me finally into a court where they could make me testify against him and also incriminate myself in the process. But it was a different day. It was a day that I said things that I couldn't believe I said. And the first thing I said when he said, state your name for the record, I said, I'm William David, formerly of the Parker family. William David Parker being the name that I was given by my parents. Well, I hadn't intended that going in. It was just, just came out of my mouth. And, um, and then the next thing that happened was the attorney took, turns around from his table and looks at me because he'd been shuffling papers and said, just go ahead and state your name for the record. And I said, what I said is I'm formerly the Parker family. And he turned around with this puzzled look on his face. And he said, what do you mean formerly the Parker family? And I said, I'm here today to die for my cause. And I wasn't, I didn't plan that one going in either, but it was part of my core. I believe that was coming out that I was there today, to, that there to die for my cause that I was willing to die for the cause of self-determination because I knew it was the only thing that was going to set us free. And I was also there because of what had happened with this particular gentleman to put him in prison for what he did because the U.S. had been honoring us and he ended up dishonoring them. And they take that very serious. It is one of the things I have to give some of the gurus credit for is that they understand this system of honor and dishonor to that degree. I got to see it in much greater degree because of our experience and what we did in the courts. But I have to say this, I think for a lot of years that even with myself, I considered this a red badge of courage that I had made this comment that I was willing to die for my cause. And so just two weeks ago, up on a Thursday morning, I woke up and talked about this. I started writing immediately as soon as I woke up that many have made bold statements about dying for the cause of freedom. And many that made those statements weren't willing to die. Uh, others did, though, and because they, they meant it. They meant they were willing to die for their cause. Now, I'm not talking about soldiers that get a paycheck or sim to simply murder people that have done nothing to them or done nothing wrong. And this was my reason for wanting out, my chief reason for wanting out. I didn't want the blood on my hands anymore because not having a court trial and not having a double witness and not having proof that somebody did something wrong and then you go kill them, well, that's just blatant murder. It's not part of my thinking. I'm not like-minded in, in that. And so if I didn't want to be a part of E Pluribus Unum, which has that mindset, then I had to separate from it. Anyway, if someone's killing you or trying to kill you and you kill them first, then what causes that? It's self-defense, but it's not freedom. This is basic military training 101. Most people I see teaching freedom and doing it from the context of death, you have to be willing to die for your cause. Malcolm X said it, you know, if you're not willing to die for the cause of freedom, then put the term out of your vocabulary. But this is also why war and revolution don't work. Even for those that revolt and are willing to die for more freedoms, if they're not willing to accept the challenge to become more educated on governance, to become more knowledgeable in advancing freedom, and accept the burden of total responsibility that comes from self-governance, then even these revolutionaries are not going to remain free. I mean, they might have learned how to use a weapon, but if they haven't learned how to govern, then they're going to end up back under the same people, a regime that they sought to escape. So those who do not learn how to self-govern will always be governed. There's no middle ground and no other options. It's been said that the price of freedom is constant vigilance. Well, yeah, it's constant vigilance once you're free. But if you're not free, then the price of freedom is as far beyond vigilance as sanity is from total delusion. And I think my life and the things that we did in court prove that. 
but this is a matter of life, and you must not only be willing to stand and die for your cause, this cause of freedom and self-determination, but you must be willing to live for that cause. That has been the greatest evolution in my thinking in the past two years, is that it's now living for this cause. So here's the choice and the solution. When, it said, when he said every man is born free and the son of a citizen, when it comes to the years of discretion, may examine whether it's convenient for him to join that society. If he does not find it advantageous to remain in it, simply quit. This stuff is so simple to understand, and it hasn't been easy, but it is simple. And since these are universal principles, things that we weren't taught, the people that are actually running things behind the scenes and even what we saw with the judges, they understand this. They may not want to do it themselves, but they do understand it. And they give a lot of grace in, in for those that are trying to do something along these lines, more so than anything else I've seen. It's just for a judge to have someone in front of them that has any knowledge and not completely and utterly ignorant, it's, it's, it's a happy day for judges, I can tell you. So anyway, but it doesn't mean to give any license for malcontents to do all these murmuring and seditions and stuff. Murmurs are whining, griping, complaining, and protesting, and this doesn't work and it doesn't help. Just like I said with the revolutionaries, if you don't learn how to self-govern, you're just going to remain governed. That's it. Now, with this all stated, let's go back to what I said in the beginning. Where's your contract that says that you have any rights? Where's your stipulation? So keep this in mind. 